for coming to the presentation on, on a Saturday afternoon. I hope that I can make your time worth it. So today, I'm going to uh, present a piece of research that I've conducted with a co-author, a uh, professor at the University of uh, British Columbia in Canada. When we conduct research, particularly in political science, we want to ask an important question, a question that has real-world implications. The question that motivated our research is the following. Why do some of the territorial disputes last for a long time? Of course, this is a very big question, and no piece of research can answer it definitively. But we hope that our research can contribute to the understanding of the question. Now, some of the examples of the, the kind of disputes that, are, that we're looking at are Kashmir, uh, conflict between India and Pakistan over the piece of territory, Taiwan, which is a big issue for China, and in the U.S.-China uh, China relations, and conflict between Palestinians and Israelis. A big part of that is about the status of uh, Jerusalem. So what do these conflicts in common? It seems that they display the characteristic of so-called issue indivisibility. Now, what do I mean by that? At least one side of the disputes has taken a position of all or nothing. And moreover, it seems that states are not willing to accept site payments to resolve such disputes. Notably also, in all of these conflicts, uh, historical ownership is involved by the parties to justify their policy positions. So there are two key things in these conflicts. One is that parties take very hardline positions. They claim the issue is indivisible. And also they associate that with historical ownership. So we asked two specific questions related to these observations. Now the first question is, can historical ownership be a source of a perception of territorial indivisibility? Now you may pause and think about, wait a minute, but territories are divisible. Now even this piece of desk physically can be divided. Now the problem with that is that the value of the desk will be lost if it's divided. So it's not that physically it cannot be divided, but its value may be lost. So we define indivisibility, or what we call a good is indivisible, is in the following sense, that it cannot be divided without losing its value significantly. All right, so if historic ownership can lead to the perception of something is indivisible, in particular territories, can this perception lead to a more uncompromising foreign policy positions on these territories, or these territory disputes? So these are the two questions that we ask in this research. Now, why is it that historic ownership possibly leading to the perception of indivisibility, and why such a perception may lead to more conflict? We offer a theoretical argument for the link, underlying link between these concepts. First, historic ownership of a territory can form an important part of a uh, of a nation's identity. Moreover, national identity is a more or less important part of an individual's identity. So we can think of individuals as more or less patriotic or nationalistic. And national identity could be a bigger or smaller part of an individual's identity. So Americans, um, for each American citizen, you have an identity about yourself. And part of it may be um, related to you being an American citizen. And so is the case with uh, Chinese citizens. Now, losing a historic, historically owned territory for a nation may lead to um, loss of national identity to some degree. And that, in turn, may affect an individual's sense of who she or he is. As a result, individuals may react with more or less emotional intensity toward a loss of territory that is considered historically owned by his or her nation. So that's our theoretical argument. Now, in political science research, it is ultimately important that we test our theory, right? It is not enough that uh, we come up with a theory. Everybody in the room potentially can come up with a theory about something. 
It is important to empirically test if the theory holds a water. We test two hypotheses derived from our theoretical argument. Now, the first hypothesis is the existence of a historical ownership uh, increases a perception of territorial indivisibility. The second hypothesis is such uh, perception, in other words, those who view a territory to be indivisible are more likely to take um, to a hard line position or support military action. The approach we use to test a theory is so-called survey experiment. It will be clear as I will uh, explain our uh, empirical design, but briefly speaking, a survey experiment is sort of a public opinion survey. But we randomly assign respondents into two different groups, for example, and the two groups uh, receive different questionnaires that are uh, different in some ways, but not entirely different. So people in this room randomly assigned to two groups, and one group receive a scenario, the other group receive a different scenario. And the purpose is to see if those two different scenarios lead to different responses from the respondents. We conducted experiment in China, and the reason for that is that China has been involved in several territorial disputes with neighboring countries. So it's a context where we can find respondents that are sensitive to these type of questions. And also China has 14 neighboring countries on land and another six um, uh, linked with uh, territorial waters. <coughs> All right, so in this context, uh, we draw 2,260 Chinese adults uh, last year. Their average age is 37. Male-female ratio, 62, 38. The uh, vast majority is urban population, and they have college degree. The vast majority has a college degree. They self-identify their social status uh, to be the following. 20% consider themselves from low-income class, 52 middle income, and 27 from high income. Um, also, 42 of the respondents work in the state-owned sector. So that means we work in the public sector might be state-owned enterprises or are working for uh, some government uh, bureaucracies. 22% are party members, Communist Party members. Now, I should point out that party members in China are, are different from what you generally think about. They're not necessarily um, important in an ideological sense. It's important if you want your career advancement that you do have to join parties to, to be eligible for a certain type of career options. So in, in some sense, people can join parties out of self-interest, uh, out of career motivations rather than ideological uh, motivation. Overall, our sample is younger, more well-off, better informed than average Chinese citizen. Now you may ask whether that's a good thing or a bad thing in terms of being representative of the entire population. We argue that it is a good thing in the following sense that these people are younger, more participatory in the political processes, they're more likely to express their opinions publicly. So in some sense, this is the population that's most likely um, having an influence in the government's position, putting pressure on the government. In that sense, this is the relevant population that we should be looking at. Um, as I talked about, that the individuals will be separated into two different groups or multiple groups, and they receive different scenarios about the, uh, the, the conflict situation that we want to ask their opinions about. So they're given the following background information. China is involved in a dispute with the militarily strong. So some group, one group received the treatment that says the, other, the neighboring country is militarily strong, and the other group received treatment that the country, the neighboring country is militarily weak. Another treatment is that this is an island dispute versus a piece of land bordering, uh, bordering two countries, which is a land dispute. And also, the territory has economic value or the territory's economic value is unknown. So basically, uh, the groups receive different treatments. The most important one, the one that's most relevant to us, is one group received the treatment 
that the disputed territory historically belonged to China. So it's the idea of historical ownership. The other group received the treatment that uh, the territory did not belong to any country. We asked two survey questions. Now the first question is ask the respondents to express whether uh, they think the following outcome of the dispute is acceptable or not. So first of all, we're getting at whether they believe uh, a certain type of outcome is acceptable or not. Now the first says the two countries share both the sovereignty and the right to use the territory. So in some sense, this is a divisible outcome. The second one is also a divisible outcome, but China has the sovereignty, the two countries share the right to use the territory. The next two are what we consider as indivisible outcomes. The first one, or the third one says that China has both sovereignty and the right to use the territory, but makes compensations to the other country. And in here, we also uh, separate the group for uh, two different treatments. One is that this compensation will be monitored by an international organization or not monitored by any third party. The fourth one is the what we consider as the extreme indivisible outcome, which says that China has both the sovereignty and the right to use the territory and does not uh, offer any compensation to the neighboring country. So what do we find? There are lots of things going on in this picture. Due to time constraint, I'm just going to highlight um, the most uh, important one. Now, the horizontal axis represent the proportion of the support for each outcome. So you can see some of these are 60%. Um, the vertical axis represent those four outcomes I just described, except the third one is divided into two. One has IO enforcement, the other does not. The red dots represent responses from the group that received the treatment that the territory was historically owned by China. The blue dots are from the groups uh, that received treatment that the territory was not owned historically by anybody. Okay, the one that I will highlight is that the group that received historic ownership treatment uh, tend to support less of sharing outcomes. So there are 20 a percent supportive of the idea of sharing sovereignty and the right to use, compared with the blue group that did not receive ownership treatment. And similarly, for other options, we can see that generally speaking, the red group support less of um, sharing and less of the idea that there's a third party enforced uh, uh, site payment. The idea of site payment generally received lower support. Again, here, they are red dots is lower than blue dots. Now, within this group, we single out a particular group of individuals who answer only the fourth outcome is acceptable. So these are what we call a hardcore indivisible group that they did not find any other options acceptable except the fourth one which says China owns both the sovereignty, the right to use the territory, and does not compensate. Out of 2,160, about 380 um, belong to this group. And this group I define here. Only acceptable outcome is the last one. And the proportion increases in the group that received the treatment that this piece of territory was historically owned by China. So comparing two groups, one received one treatment that says no historic ownership of the territory, and the other received the treatment that it was historically owned by China. The group received that treatment tend to have more of the, these such individuals that holds a uh, more extreme view. Now the second question we ask is, we remind the respondents that the following policies are all on the table. So the Chinese government has adopted in the past and may adopt in the future these policies and measures to address actual territory disputes. Do you find each of the following option uh, appropriate for the hypothetical dispute scenario? The first is intensifying externally driven um, propaganda, directed uh, propaganda, imposing economic sanctions, taking military actions, reaching a compromise through bilateral bargaining, and submitting the dispute to international organizations. <coughs> so all these policies are familiar to the respondents and we ask their level of support. Now the last one is the current one. 
uh, at least on an actual dispute, which is a Diao Yi Shinkaku's dispute between China and Japan. And the government position, position has been shelving the dispute, meaning that put it aside. Let's not spend uh, time um, worrying over this right now, but maybe uh, continue to cooperate with Japan on economic issues and leave this for uh, future generations to, to solve. So that's the current official position. Now, this picture shows um, responses from between the, the group that I just defined as hardcore indivisible group and the group that allows some compromises, which is the vast majority of the respondents. Now, the horizontal axis, again, is the level of support in proportion. Vertical axis are those policy options I, I just described. Now, the takeaway point from this picture is that, so the red dots represent those hardcore individuals' responses. And they tend to support more of the conflictual policies. So economic sanctions has higher support from these individuals than from those individuals who think that some level of compromise is acceptable. And also these individuals, hardcore indivisible individuals, tend to support more of military actions. And for the rest of the policy options that involve bilateral bargaining and IO uh, mediation, uh, we can see that hardcore individuals tend to support less of those uh, choices. So to conclude, Historic ownership does seem to lead to a perception of territorial indivisibility, at least within the experimental setting. Um, such a perception does tend to uh, increase support for more conflictual policy options, such as economic sanctions and military actions. So what do we have for leaders or policy implications of our re research? Policy implications is that, on the one hand, um, historical ownership, as an argument, can increase public support for hardline positions for leaders. In some sense, it strengthens leaders' bargaining position internationally. At the same time, it may lock leaders into positions that they find difficult to back down later on, because precisely because uh, there is a high public support to be uh, more aggressive. So leaders want to be very careful about using this argument seeing its benefit, but also seeing its um, negative implications down the road. All right, we are interested in carrying out this experiment in other countries as well in the future. All right, thank you.